Rob Doster here. I got Jeff Goodman with me. Hell no. John Fink. Are we still live? Kill the 68 till I die. I'm sorry, man. I'm blacked out. Randolph Children. DJ Khaled. You know the big DJ Khaled guy? Hands grow up and in. Goodman needs to be fired all the time. Josh Tasker. You're going to beat people straight up. You know the deal. They have no swag. They have no nothing. Terrell McNeil. From the bluest of the blue bloods to the smallest of the mid majors. This is Feel the 68 after dark. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Saturday evening edition of the Field of 68 After Dark. Jeff Goodman, Kevin Sweeney, Rob Doss. We are live. Sirius XM Channel 84. That is College Sports Radio. And we are streaming over on the Field of 68 YouTube channel. Gentlemen, half of the Final Four has officially been set in stone. Nate Oates has taken number four seed Alabama to the Final Four. Fresh off of an 89-82 win over Terrence Oglesby's Clemson Tigers. We're going to let T.O. We were going to have him on. We're going to let him wipe away those tiger tears right now. Let him let him recover for a moment before we start uh, breaking his balls too much. And UConn, 77, Illinois, 52, in what was one of the more dominant performances that we've seen in recent Elite Eight history. Uh, Kevin Sweeney, what are your first impressions of two teams now in the Final Four? Biggest takeaways. Um, I guess I would go back to the offseason, right, and what both teams had to go through to get here. Uh, obviously. UConn to lose Andre Jackson, Adama Sanogo, uh, Jordan Hawkins, such you know, integral parts of their team, um, and, and keep the hunger and the drive and, and, and everything it takes to make runs like this in this tournament. It has been so ridiculously hard for teams to consistently uh, win in March. I mean, again, the last three champions before UConn have not made it out of the first weekend since. So for them to be, be back in the Final Four uh, says everything about what, what Dan Hurley does and, and then what Nate Oates did was ridiculous rebuilding, right? All three assistants to head jobs, uh, dealing with obviously a you know massive roster turnover, whether it's Brandon Miller, Noah Clowney, even Quinterly late in the late in the process. I think they lost seven of their top eight, six of their top seven, seven something like that. Um, for for those guys to be on this stage in Phoenix next week, I think says everything about the coaches of those two guys are, and uh, certainly fired up about the matchup. Yeah, it's uh, it's going to be. Um, quite the entertaining matchup, Jeff. Your biggest takeaways from two Elite Eight games that we've seen today and half of the Final Four set for Phoenix. You know, I mean, again, like I'm not surprised. Obviously, nobody is about UConn. Nobody is. We've seen this coming all year. The fact that they've been able to deliver in every game the way they have is super impressive. But again, the way Dan Hurley motivates these guys, and he's got the right players around him, right? He added Cam Spencer, the perfect guy to be able to kind of self-motivated, right? Like, you don't even have to motivate him. Uh, Stephen Castle, just like he's not rattled by anything. So UConn, the expectation was they would be here again. Alabama, listen, how long ago was it that you and I went down? And saw Auburn and Alabama in that doubleheader. What was that, about a month ago? Uh, A little more, about six weeks. Okay, six weeks ago. I walked away from that saying, there's no way in hell Alabama's getting the Final Four. There's no chance in hell. I looked at that team, and I was like, all right, it's Mark Sears and not a whole lot else. You know what's what's funny about that? Yeah. Is we left that Saturday, right? I I remember this specifically. We were on the court in Neville Arena, and – all we were talking about was, man, this Kentucky team. We told you, <laughs> right, right, Kentucky figured right. it out. They're for Coach real, Cal turned this yeah. thing around. Yeah, I remember they Coach Cal. Defense now. Coach Cal kind of yelled at everybody in the post game, and <laughs> um, and and Nate Oates again, like, and he said it for how long now? I mean, he said it to me last week. He's like, I'm not taking any more dudes that don't guard. I'm done. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe, maybe you should. <laughs> hey, Nate, Nate, just like roll with it, man, because it's working. Whatever it is, you're going to your first Final Four, Alabama's first Final Four. And, again, I keep going back to this. Like, when they hired Nate Oates, when Greg Byrne, and it was like a stealth hire five years ago. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew it was coming. Greg Byrne does a great job of this, right? Nobody knew. And all of a sudden, he hires him, and I'm like, Nate Oates at Alabama? Like, what the hell are we doing here? Like, I respect the hell out of Greg Byrne, but, like, they're not going to understand a word he says. Number one, but I, again, it worked because he inherited enough talent and won right away. Yep. And that dude, the style he plays, everybody wants to play for, right? 
the, the personality that he has. These are two, by the way, Dan Hurley and Nate Oates, two of the brashest coaches you're ever going to find in mm -hmm. any sport. Look, I, I think they're just convicted in who they are, right? Like Nate Oates walks into the, the SEC with – like, you know, I'm, I'm a high school coach. I've played this style. I know it works. And, look, if, if I come in 13th and I get fired, I'd rather that with the hope of trying to go win the league and go compete in the tournament and do all this than try to come in eighth every year and save my job for a decade, right? And Dan Hurley, like, obviously, you know, he's talked about looking in the mirror after uh, New Mexico State and having to grow up, whatever. But, like, Dan Hurley is still the same Dan Hurley. He's still the high school coach. He said it today. He's, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm a high school coach masquerading at the college level, right? And I think those two guys – like we talk all the time about like what it takes for these dudes to move up to the highest level and be successful. I think the most important thing is to have such belief in who you are as a coach. And those two dudes are not lacking in confidence. That is for sure. Yeah. Let's talk about UConn. Let's talk about what they did tonight because it felt like for probably the first 18 to 19 minutes of the game that Illinois was doing everything that they needed to do to be able to have a chance to pull off this upset. Um, they were able to kind of stymie UConn in the in and around the lane. Um, they were able to to make Tristan Newton uncomfortable. They were able to run UConn off the three point line. UConn got some good looks that they missed. It's going to happen uh, because Illinois was able to make them a little bit uncomfortable. I would make the argument that, that was the best defensive half anybody's played against UConn this entire season. And I've watched every single defensive half or every single half of UConn basketball this entire season. Uh, but then in the second half, the uh, the Avalanche started Jeff, and we. Saw saw um, UConn kind of turn into the juggernaut that, that they've been this this tournament. And I want to start with this with you. Donovan Kling, 22 points, 10 boards, five blocks. He was robbed, by the way. He should have had at least eight blocks, three steals. That was as good of a defensive performance as I, have, I ever remember seeing, ever, by a big guy in the NCAA tournament. Yeah, I mean, I can't remember one in a while. Right. I mean, obviously, I think Shaq probably was was as dominant. But uh, this one was so dominant that in the second half, Terrence Shannon was, like, scared to look at the basket at mm -hmm. times. You know, he brought it in there three straight times at one point, twice in a row, and got swatted. And Terrence Shannon probably is the most aggressive dude in all of college basketball, right? Now, I think we'll talk about this later about Illinois, but, like, if he had a floater game, if he had a mid-range game, it might have been a little different. They had one play early in the second half where, if you remember, Shannon got to the basket he missed kind of a runner. And then there was an offensive board. Somebody had it, and he missed it. And I think, again, I'm not sure it would have been any different, but the floodgates opened, and there was no way they were stopping him because, again, King Klong was – he was – Kling Kong. Kling Kong. Kling Kong. Whatever it was. Kling Kong was in there, and everybody was terrified of him. Well, you had me thinking the, the, the whatever of Bristol. You know, the, the Great Wall of Bristol. Great Wall of Bristol, yeah. I don't know. So, yeah, Kling, Kong is, Kling Kong is the offensive end. The Great Wall of Bristol is the defensive end. That's well, what I've determined. Yeah, I, I mean, offensively, listen, usually he wasn't as good as, as – this was about as good as he's been overall well, it's offensively. This was a it, – it, it's always going to be a matchup thing with him on the offensive end of the floor because we talked about it last night. I don't want to rehash the whole thing, but he's seven foot three with a high waist. He's never going to be backing people down. Right, if you're if you're shorter and stronger and have more leverage, like he's just not built. It's just physics, right? But Coleman Hawkins is not shorter. He's not stronger. He's not more stout. And uh, when you're going to try to play him one on one, you don't really have a chance. And I thought Sweeney was really smart that um, it was a point for that UConn staff to go to Donovan early and often. The first two sets they ran were the exact same one where they basically set up a clear out to try to get the lob over the top. It was honestly like it was a play that they stole from Creighton to be able to get a, a dunk for him. First one he missed, got wedged up between the rim. Second one, dunks at home, and it was kind of off from there. Yeah, I think the confidence was was massive for him early on. And then, again, you block a couple shots, and, and you start to feel it. I mean, look, is anyone ever going to shoot 0 for 19 on, like, shots against Klingon again? Probably not. But, like, that stat is ridiculous ridiculous what he did so, defensively. elaborate on what that stat was uh so i think it was uh espn stats and info said that um on every shot uh, donovan clean contested 19 shots in this game and illinois didn't make a single one of them right and, and that was the story was that illinois you know the way that they play is very much like we're gonna get we're gonna send two to the as soon as someone sends two to the ball we're gonna spray it we're gonna attack the rim and we're gonna be super aggressive and we have guys who can go get downhill obviously shannon you know the leader of that charge but 
Garrier and and even you know even some of the guys that come off the bench like they are going to fly at the basket with reckless abandon. They're going to either get foul. Or they're going to finish the rim, and they could not do anything. Ty Rogers mm-hmm. could not do anything. Um, they were completely eliminated at the rim. And, and once I think they felt the weight of that, then things really broke down. And then UConn can get into their transition game. And when you like look, I know we we can label a million different things that make UConn great. To me, I think the thing that true like everything else is is gravy if you can stop them in transition like if you can take UConn out of all their transition stuff you have a chance to beat them if you let them go running like they did in that you know four five six minute stretch in the second half it is over I mean look everyone talks about the 30 nothing run in four minutes and 20 seconds in the second half UConn went 20 to zero like yeah. scored 20 points in four minutes and it's just a track meet everybody's flying down I mean Samson Johnson had a couple dunks like ever it, it is Again, the sets are great. Everything's phenomenal, but it doesn't matter well, the, when you the, can't stop them from Here's the thing is they have – there's so many different ways that they can beat you. Yeah. Like that, that is not what they want to do. They don't want to get up and down and run the floor. That's not what this team is. That was more last year's team. This year what they want to do is get it in the half court. They'll walk it up. There's a little bit of Virginia vibes where they can kind of take the pace out of the game and make it so you have to guard for so long that you just kind of – you know, your, your legs will get tired on a specific possession. And – if they want to run, though, they can still run. Opportunistic is yeah. probably the word I would use. Yeah, and if they want to, um, if it's going to, sometimes it's going to be a Cam Spencer game. Sometimes it's going to be Steph Castle taking over, and we'll talk about him later. Sometimes it's going to be Tristan Newton taking over. Today it was Donovan Klingon. Like most teams, the thing that that the the threat about Illinois today, right, Jeff, was they had three guys that could take over a game and win it for you, but that's it. UConn kind of has five guys that can do that. You, you know what I was surprised about early is that. Shannon was almost like a decoy standing on the corner, and they didn't use him early. Now, Domask was rolling. He was. He was rolling. But I felt like you had to have them both going at that point. I was waiting and waiting and waiting. And, again, obviously with Klingon in there, it's different. But when Samson Johnson came in, like you needed to have at that point well, the first- Shannon get his confidence up where he could attack. He never did. And then he's in transition. He's going to go. We know that. But, like, in the half court, he just stood there. Well, the, he was standing there. Here's the thing. There was that, – that's that's kind of what their offense is. Like, they'll we'll take turns and they'll go one-on-one. But they never took turns. Them. It was um, dumbass because well, he was they rolling. Did, they did. But the, you, you have, like, the one – there's, like, one dude in college basketball that is kind of built to be able to slow down Terrence Shannon. And I think it's Stephen Cat. Like, what but he, he did didn't on the have defense. to is what I'm saying. He didn't have to. If you watch it early – Mm-hmm. He just stood there. He didn't have to. I, we'll watch the film later, and we can determine watch whether it, or not watch it. Um, but the the biggest thing was to me was um, that they had clean at the rim, sure. To defend, that they had that help, that they had that guy that could clean up all of those messes, and he did an unbelievable job cleaning up all of those messes. We caught up with Donovan Klingon after the game. All right, Donovan, 22, 10, and 5, but the story of the game, a 30 and 0 run. Did you have any idea it was 30 and 0? No, I mean, you know, I remember the first media, I looked at the guys, and I said, you know, they haven't scored in four minutes, but then I realized, you know, we scored 12. I was like, all right. And then, you know, we just kept playing, kept playing. And then, you know, after the game, someone came up to me and said, you know, there was the longest streak since I can't remember, 1990 something. And then he ran a 30 0 run. And I was like, oh, wow. That's, that's unreal. I mean, that's. You know, we, we don't think about that. You know, some teams, you know, they get a little bit of a lead and they'll slow down. And us, you know, we just try to keep going because, you know, teams are going to try to fight back. And your coach is a lunatic. Yeah. So he, he's on you. If you're up 30, 40, it doesn't matter, right? He's still yeah. put your foot in the gas? Oh, yeah, foot on the gas. So your, your first play of the game. Can I go back to your first play of the game? Oh, my God, yeah. I'm looking at you and I'm like, oh, wow. like, it may be a long night. Yeah, I said that to myself. <laughs> I was like. I can't believe I just started the game that way. You know, I should have put, you know, Dunked my it. elbows through the rim. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I unlike last game, you know, I just forgot about that play and just moved on to the next one. And I think it was – I can't remember what I did after that. You did – wait, wait, you did a lot after that. <laughs> okay, you did a lot after that. I, I still say this is one of the most dominant defensive performances. Forget about your 22 points that I've seen in a long time. Terrence Shannon wouldn't look at the rim in the second half, legitimately. Mm-hmm. Did you feel like at a certain point that that it just completely changed where you you were intimidating them? Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit, you know, but then the second half, Quincy Gorey or whatever, however he says his last name, um, sorry. 
Quincy Garrier. Um, when he came in, I was like, you know, I'm not letting him dunk on me. Um, you know, I, I try to say that to myself all the time. Um, you know, I try not to let anyone dunk on me. And, you know, I just walled up, got all ball. And, you know, I, I just feel like after that, they were much more scared to come in the paint. Our, our own Rob Dosser talked to your dad at halftime. And uh, he said that you didn't make your free throws. He was kind of disappointed in you. Yeah, he was kind of disappointed in you. Yeah, I mean, I got to make my free throws, you know, especially at this time of year. You know, this is when it all matters. And, you know, sometimes games might come down to one or two points. And, you know, the first thing you go look at is free throws. So, Final four. You're two wins away from defending. I know you don't want to hear the word defending. I know, but, I it, you, right? but we still talk yeah. about it. Defending. First team since Florida in 06 and 07. You guys were, were – having fun after this one. I wasn't sure how you guys were going to react, like how much you were going to celebrate. You guys are celebrating this one. I mean, I feel like some of the guys, I feel like a lot of the new guys are celebrating more than the returners. I think the returners know what's at stake and how hard the next two games are going to be. Um, you know, but one game at a time. And, you know, it's a good thing to celebrate. You know, we got young guys. We got transfers that never experienced, you know, this high level of, you know, basketball so you know it's it's good to enjoy it maybe today and then tomorrow you flip the switch and worry about who we got by next all right i must say it i know because everybody wants to see this we're, we're a game away hopefully from you against zach Eady. Yes. I, I know you don't want to look right. forward i know you don't Trust me, you're good. but man i want to see that so bad you guys against purdue the storylines that mm -hmm. could be there right defending against the team that, that is looking for redemption, mm -hmm. two best big men in the country. How bad would you like to play Zach Eady? Me, yeah, I'd love it. You know, I, I'm, you know, I try to, you know, I don't shy away from anything. You know, I want to play against, you know, the best of the best, to, you know, just prove myself. And, you know, I'm, you know, he's one heck of a player. He does a lot of, you know, unique things. And, you know, he's a special, special player, big, strong. And, you know, so I'm just, you know, I'm just looking forward to going to Phoenix and you know, taking care of business one game at a time. Bring your sunscreen. Yes, sir. Let's go Phoenix. Donovan was awesome tonight. He was almost as good in the interview. Uh, we worked with him on making sure he could pronounce all of these names correctly. Uh, so we will make sure that he can get Mark Sears and Nick Pringle. They're easy. These. Yeah, those are easy. He so won't screw them up. Donovan, he, you'll be fine. Yeah, he won't screw those ones up. Um, Jeff, I, I want to talk about Steph Castle here because I do think that it is really impressive that you have a five-star freshman, a potential lottery pick, and a guy that just – does not seem to give a damn about anything other than winning, right? How important is he to this culture, to this locker room, and the fact that he was probably the second best player on the floor for UConn tonight simply because he held Terrence Shannon in the check? Yeah, I mean, listen, you, you see him up there and you would have no idea, right? You would have no idea the way he carries himself that he was going to be a lottery pick, that he came in as highly touted as he did. But um, that's kind of the beauty of this program a little bit, that, you know, Dan Hurley knows it. He gives him his props every every press conference. What does he say? Mm -hmm. He says that, right? He makes it clear that, hey, I love Steph Castle, his family, the way he conducts himself, the way he's bought into all this. And, again, freshmen, you just you don't see guys like this that want to defend before they want to score. Mm -hmm. Mature as they come. Like, ha has come in, not worried about the stats, not worried about hunting shots and numbers, like, just made plays, done what he's been asked, and made a huge impact on this UConn team. Yeah, he's. Uh, I think that he kind of epitomizes the the culture yeah. of this UConn program. Listen, when we come back, we do want to kind of talk a little bit about Illinois, put a bow on their season. Um, it was an incredible year for the Illini, and a disappointment. We'll talk about that next. The best month of the year is here, which is why you need to know that we are partnered with BetMGM. We'll be using BetMGM lines for making all of our picks and predictions, and we'll have special offers for the listeners and the viewers of the Field of 68. If you haven't signed up for BetMGM yet, you can use bonus code FIELD, and you will get up to a $1,500 first bet offer on your first wager with BetMGM. Here's the best part. All you need to do is deposit and bet $10 of your hard-earned money to get it. This is what you have to do to make it work. Download the BetMGM app and sign up using that bonus code at FIELD. Deposit at least $10 and place your first wager on any game. You'll get up to $1,500 in bonus bets if your bet loses. Just make sure you use that bonus code FIELD when you sign up. Most importantly, 
We have some fun stuff coming up for the rest of the NCAA tournament. Bet insurance tokens, college hoops odds boost, and the thing that I love the most, a nice little parlay boost, as well as a ridiculous array of prop bets for anything that you could possibly imagine betting on. From odds on getting to the Final Four to National Championship futures, I'm calling it right now. Bet MGM is the king of the prop bet. So go download the Bet MGM app. Use that code FIELD and sign up today. And while I've got you a quick request, the best way to support the Field of 68 content you get for free is to engage with us. Rate and review the pod in any podcast app. Like and share the YouTube videos that you enjoy. Tell your friends about us. It all helps in a world where the algorithm is king. And now, back to the show. Welcome back to the Field of 68 After Dark. We are live from TD Garden Arena here in Boston. As you can tell, we are up in the, uh, I think it's technically the hockey. It's um, a hockey press box. The hockey yeah. press box here. It's a, it's a long way. I just looked over. It's a long way down. If, you have, if you're afraid of heights, get the hell out of the show right now because that is not a fun look. You can see all the Bruins banners over there. Um, Goodman is a diehard I Bruins. covered some. Die I covered some Bruins, Bruins games back in the day. Diehard Bruins yeah. fans. Um, yeah. All right, let's talk about Illinois because – uh, I kind of go both ways on the way that I look at it, right? On the one hand, getting to the Elite Eight with a team where we said heading into the year, I don't know if Domas is good enough. I don't know if you can trust Coleman Hawkins. I don't know if Terrence Shannon can shoot it well enough. They have everything going on with Terrence Shannon's legal situation, and they still find a way to win the Big Ten tournament title and make it to the Elite Eight and kind of get that like we get upset in the first weekend monkey off of their back, right? On the other hand, you get to the Elite Eight and you play 18 minutes with a chance to, you know, knock off the number one seed, Sweeney, and then everything just kind of falls apart. The wheels fall off the bus and you end up going home in a game that was uh, ultimately uncompetitive. Look, I think this is a heck of a year. I mean, it was the, the breakthrough that they desperately needed. Obviously, this program has been starving for a second weekend. They get that. Um, you know, this, this obviously they're going to lose a lot of guys, but to me, like this year is the true proof concept beyond the io and kofi days like here's what we can build here's how we want our program to look like i i think illinois is going to try to build in this vein moving forward big athletic uh switchable skill like this was a massive uh, a massive year for brad underwood he delivered in every way look i know there's gonna be a lot of criticism about how he managed this game right and i and i i don't think he should be immune to that because i think we can criticize the ty rogers matchups and whatnot uh, I do want to say this, though. Like, there has been a lot of criticism in particular about playing Ty Rogers, knowing that Donovan Klingon was going to be on the floor mm -hmm. and they were going to guard him that, that way and it was going to f screw up the flow of the offense. And pr particularly, I've seen people say, well, they did it against Purdue and it didn't work. Well, they did it against Purdue twice. They did it against Purdue in January and it didn't work. They then fixed it. They did it in March against Purdue again. March 5th, I was there. And they scored 1.1 points per possession. Ty Rogers was fantastic. They even kind of bothered Edie, Edie a little bit, especially in the first half. Second half, Edie took over. He was great. But, like, the idea that this was, like, a known thing, that it doesn't work, and that, you know, they can't play Ty Rogers in these games, it, to me, is not accurate. And I think it's probably unfair to Brad Underwood. Look, I would have pulled the plug earlier. I would have yeah. tried to get Goody on the floor, play with spacing, hope you make a bunch of shots, knowing that's what you need. But I think Brad Underwood did a great job this year, and I don't. I think the criticism today has been over the top. Yeah, and and just to add to that, you know what they did without Ty Rogers on the floor? The same thing with Quincy Garrier, right. where they just kind of let dared him to shoot, and it would have been the same exact thing. Um, it's just that instead of blocking Ty Rogers shots at the rim, you had Donovan Klingon blocking Garrier dunks at the rim. I said it all year. I, I just think they needed another point guard. I think they needed. <laughs> I, I did. No, but it's true. It's true. If you had a guy that no, Domas just, could play you know, off the ball, you, Shannon, could, and they could make their lives easier. I mean, easier. I think the reason why Damask was so good was he was on the ball. Like, you yeah, don't get this, no, Domas. Yeah, but he like, could, they he unlocked could, all of this stuff in the because first they half. didn't have a point Yes, in the first half they did. But, Demas, but, I mean, Demas but it would be even better. But it would even be better to me. It would run even smoother if those no, guys – because you wouldn't be able to – If you had a guy making life easier for them. You needed – you can't have somebody that can't shoot out there. You cannot. Well, no. It, well, of course, like Ty Rogers is the – it's a weird fit at times. But I don't think the issue was not having a point guard. I think the, that – Well, point, you got to have a shooter. I think the issue was that they decided over and over and over again, we're going to go challenge the great wall of Bristol at the rim. Like the, the big thing for me was 
You didn't shoot threes. You, they needed they needed to be able to just kind of – well, one, they needed Shannon to try to find something in the mid-range somewhere and stop challenging people at the rim. They needed Coldman Hawkins to show up. Like he – where was he tonight? Like yeah. Terrence Shannon taking a lot of criticism. They were two for seven from three, though, I think, in the first half. Yeah, they're not a great – Both by demand. Like yeah. kind of, I know, but you have to be against UConn. When you're taking it in there, you're not shooting mid-range shots. You're going to take it at him. It keeps coming back. You better be a three-point shooting team. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, – But it was a hell of a year. Listen, yeah. like Sweeney said, bottom line is you are playing with house money tonight. Right. You're playing get, with house if money. If they get drawn into a different region with the way they were playing – Yeah, they like, might have won. They were hot as yeah. heck coming yeah. into this NCAA tournament. Yeah. They've been great in this tournament, like two convincing wins, obviously, out in Omaha, and then you know beat a really good Iowa State team. Like, sure. Iowa State has been phenomenal in the last month. They beat them, really mm -hmm. controlled that game. Like, any other region – there's a world we're talking about Illinois as a Final Four team. And, you know, look, I think they had a chance to beat anyone in this field other than UConn. And look, these guys are just a wagon. Like, we, we, we can't say it enough. Like, they're, they are so darn good, and they are a tough matchup for Illinois with the size, the physicality. A guy who could match up Shannon, as we said, with Steph Castle. Uh, just wasn't their night. Like, it was going to take a perfect game for them to be, be in the mix. Uh, they, they didn't play well. They obviously grew that. But – uh, a great year for for Underwood and that team. Let's pivot to the other game that happened tonight, the other Final Four. Um, Nate Oates, Alabama, advance to the Final Four with a team that's built around a guy from Ohio, a guy from North Dakota State, yeah. a guy from Hofstra, a guy from Wofford by way of Dodge City Community College. Like he's He's been able to kind of piece this thing together despite the fact that he lost his entire coaching staff to head coaching jobs in the offseason. Um, he was supposed to get his starting point guard back and didn't get him. He was supposed to get his starting center back and didn't have him come back. And here we are uh, on March 30th, and Alabama is heading to the Final Four, Jeff. Uh, we already know that you think Nate Oates is probably the greatest coach in the history of coaches. I, I do think Nate's unbelievable for what he's done. How do you think Javon Quinterly's feeling right now? Um, rich. Yeah. All right, rich, but <laughs> would you rather be going to a – Final four could have stuck around. I and think maybe... it depends on the kid. Yeah, good point. Mm -hmm. Good point. Um, this coaching job is one of the better coaching jobs I've ever seen. I, I really believe that. Like taking this team this far, and again, they were good in the regular season. It's not like they were fluky like NC State. Like they were really good for most of the year. They had a chance to to compete for an SEC title up until the end. And like you said. They lose Brandon Miller, but we knew that. But he he was, you know, arguably the best player and you know, second best player in college basketball last year. Betty Ako leaves and, and takes a two way contract. And what are they missing more than anything? What do we say all year? Rim, Rim protection. Protector. Right? Yes. Quinterly leaves in like July. Literally in July. And we look at his team, we're like, okay, Mark Sears, he's a nice player. He's a nice player, but like he's a small guard. That's not like super dynamic, not like the quickest dude in the world, not the most athletic dude in the world. But my God, does he find a way to do it every single night? So I, I just think what Nate has done, honestly, is like really remarkable this year. And what he's done for this program in five years yeah, so is give, remarkable. Give, give the stats. Yeah. Give the stats. So Let's talk about what five years at, at Alabama, uh, three Sweet 16s and a Final Four. Uh, two SEC championships, two SEC tournament championships, the number one overall seed. Like, this dude is a force of nature. Like, mm -hmm. again, what they had to attack, he had no assistance to go recruit the portal last spring. Like, right. it's just him and you know, hired a couple of guys. He hired Clonch pretty Klons quick. In, yeah. But, like, they were scrambling, doing whatever they could to piece together a roster. I mean, look, uh, Stevenson had a huge day today. He's a reclass kid, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it is unreal what he has done with this group to, to, to have them in a position to go play for play, play in a final four. And uh, obviously what a moment for, for the Alabama program, not a place that's known for basketball. Right. And he has never run from that challenge, never run from the label of football school, whatever he is just roll up his sleeves, went to work and, and been one of the best coaches in college basketball. Yeah. And the, the thing that I love about watching them is that their kind of commitment to what they are going to do and who they are going to be. You know what I mean? And I think he's done a really good job of, uh, and Hurley's done this as well, identifying the pieces that are going to fit into what he wants to do. Like, there's a lot of guys that will adapt what they do based off the roster that they get. They're like, I'm going to go out and get all of the talent that I possibly can, 
and try to find a way to figure it out with the guys that I have and the pieces that I have, right? Whereas Nate Oates is just kind of like, well, you got to be able to shoot it. I need some guards that can create on their own and create space. Uh, I need big guys at the rim that are going to be able to dunk some shit at the rim, right? Catch some lobs. And if you happen to be six foot ten, capable of dunking some shit at the rim and also making a three, then uh, yeah, I need like seventeen of those dudes, right? And he just finds those pieces and finds what like it's it's similar, it's similar to what Kelvin does, right? Kelvin Sampson, where Kelvin is like, all right, give me the toughest SOBs that you can find. Well, you know what's crazy about it, like. Kelvin's got his staff and he's had him. They know what he wants. Mm -hmm. Nate just brought in three new dudes. Usually it takes some time before the assistants know exactly what you want, but it's so clear with Nate. Mm -hmm. It's so clear that, like, he can bring in the three of us slap dicks. We'd figure it out quickly. Well, me and Sweeney would. You would. Uh, I, I don't know, man. You thought Terrence Shannon was uh, playing bad. Watch him. First watch him. Just go you watch thought, the tape. Thought... Break it down, baby. I break will. it down. Doster film room down. time. Come yeah, on. We, nah, might we need the film room. We might have to get some more, yeah. some more film room pre presented by the Autograph app, right. by the way. Right. Autograph. A lot of people had trouble getting tickets into this building. If you had downloaded the Autograph app and used code F68, you could have gotten $16 tickets. $16. $16 tickets into the building. I bet tonight. you they'll have them for the Here's, Final Four, too. It's a TD 16 Garden, bucks. $16. That's wow. not bad. That's not bad. Um, let's put a bow on, on this Clemson run. Brad Rennell, uh, lifetime contract at this point. He probably already has it. Goodman wants it. I mean, look. I'm so excited for Brad. You know why? I don't have to put him in the hot seat anymore. Like, I don't have to feel bad. Every year I do the hot seat, I, I type out Brad, Brunel, comma, Clemson. Every year. All right, so he makes the NIT the next two years. Are you going to be itching in 2026? <laughs> no, I, I don't want to do it anymore. I'm done. <laughs> look, he, I'm he done. Made, I'll be retired by the time Brad Brunel gets Clemson back to the made, hot seat. Clemson made the – the elite eight for the first time since 1980 give and graham neff a lot of credit yes. okay i've said this before a young ad a young ad who basically said to brad a year plus ago and he said if you don't make the tournament you're done and they're they're good buddies and brad didn't make the tournament and he said he did a lot of, of looking around and talking and he said you know what i'm not getting better than brad right now I'm not going to make a move. We're, we're doing well. Tickets, people are showing up. We got most of our team hopefully coming back. I love Brad Burnell. He's a great dude. I'm going to give him another chance. Gives him another chance, and they go to the Elite Eight. Great story. Great yes, story. Great story. Listen, uh, when we come back, we're going to be talking about this UConn-Alabama matchup, and we're going to be talking about the two great games that we have on the docket tomorrow, Purdue and Tennessee, and a Tobacco Road rivalry, Duke-NC State. That's next. Whether you are a world-class athlete or a podcaster like myself, we all understand the importance of mental and physical well-being and proper recovery for top-notch performance. After a six-month season loaded with cross-country travel and late nights, I can promise you that proper recovery is a priority for me these days. That is why I'm excited that Unified Healing is sponsoring this episode of The Field of 68. Unified Healing is a new and super innovative global network of wellness centers that's powered by the Energy Enhancement System, or the EE System. If you haven't heard of the EE System yet, you'll want to listen up. This technology promotes wellness, deep relaxation, purification, and rejuvenation. Whether you're here in New Jersey or at hundreds of other locations across the globe, access to a center is easy, and affordable. Are you interested in experiencing the EE system technology for yourself? Well, all you got to do is go to unifiedhealing.com slash field to learn more and find a center near you. You can find that link in the description below. That's unified, U-N-I-F-Y-D, healing.com slash field. No material or testimonials on the Unified Healing website are intended to be viewed as medical advice or as a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before you undertake a new healthcare regimen, including the EE system. Yeah. Well, welcome back to the Saturday evening edition of the Field of 68 After Dark. We are live from TD Garden Arena. I got Jeff Goodman. I got Kevin Sweeney. My name is Rob Dawson. We're live Sirius XM channel 
84, fresh off of watching UConn cut down the nets. It's been a lot of chances I've had to be able to see UConn cut down the nets in the last 12 months. Last year at the Final Four, last year in the national title, uh, this year at the Big East tournament, this year at the Final Four. Uh, it's getting a little bit repetitive, you know. It's getting, it's, it's. I'm, I'm getting a little too comfortable and too used to seeing them cut down <laughs> all of these nets. It's, uh, I've been pretty. I, I, look, you guys can. Dude, you had 10 years of losing. You had 10 years of being a loser. Well, you had a lot more time of being a loser. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that's, yeah. it. that's it. Um, all right, let's, let's, let's talk about what we got coming up uh, tomorrow for these games. Purdue, Tennessee, Duke, North Carolina State. For, for me, I think Purdue, Tennessee is the most interesting matchup that we're going to get in the Elite Eight this year. Um, I thought it would part, be tonight. In large part because you have, uh, you have Zach Eady, you have Dalton Connect, these two teams have played before, but the difference is we didn't see Zakai Ziegler the last time these two teams played. We didn't see the real Dalton Connect the last time that these two teams played. Sweeney, break down this matchup for me. What does Tennessee have to do to take down number one seed Purdue? I think a big question is how this game's officiated. Um, when they met in Maui, it was a foul fest. Like it was ugly. So ugly. Took the entire flow out of the game. Like Look, if you've watched Purdue this tournament, like you know they want to play faster. They want to like they want to flow into stuff, and um, I think they're going to try to do that against Tennessee. Tennessee's comfortable with that. Tennessee wants to play fa faster too. I know it, it. It sounds weird to say you're saying Purdue, Tennessee, Matt Payne, or Rick Barnes. You're thinking like, all right, it's going to be a grinder. We run our sets, do it, do our thing. Like, you no, know, like like ever. I think both teams want to fly up and down and 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 get good shots. Like obviously Dalton's a huge deal in this game. I'm curious how Purdue guards him. You know, Gillis and, and Heidi, I think, are the two guys that probably are the best matchup. Like, can Lance Jones really guard Dalton Connect? Because he's so much smaller, like, and Dalton releases it so high, right? Like, like Dalton's going to get his shots up, and he has obviously the ability to to win a game. Um, the Adu foul trouble question versus mm -hmm. Edie is huge. Look, Tennessee has a ton of bodies to throw out. They can go get a Waka in there. They can go get uh, even, like, Estrella. Like, look, is, is Estrella going to be <laughs> – like good enough to hang with he didn't know but like give us you can get five he can get five right? like he's deeper like they're, they're deeper in the front court than most teams if you see jp estrella for limited minutes tennessee's done they're done <laughs> that's fair they're done like like they have the body so i, I think it's gonna be a fascinating game i, I think the point guard matchup probably decides it right like Bingo. Braden versus Bingo. akai um who's better tomorrow i think is is who wins the game um Braden smith has been ridiculous in this tournament like the the people who believe this is just a Zach Eady and everybody else team, like I don't know what game they're watching. It's certainly right. He's been year. a top five point guard all year. He's been all year. phenomenal. Yeah, and, and he has delivered in March. Yep. Um, look, Zach was not great, especially early yesterday. I mean, the numbers are great. I think he had twenty seven, fourteen, whatever. But like, it took him a while to get going, and they hung in there against Gonzaga because Braden Smith and Lance Jones were awesome, mm -hmm. and that is why they've been able to be as good as they've been in this tournament. If that continues, I think Purdue's winning this game, and I think Purdue's probably getting to play UConn in the national title game, depending, obviously, what happens to the other game. But, I mean, if, if not, Tennessee's got a real chance to go knock them off. So, in the first game they played against each other, Fletcher Lawyer had 27. It's true. And if Fletcher Lawyer – I've always said, like, he's kind of their X factor, right? Like, if he plays really well, how many teams can beat him? If they've got Zach Eady, Braden Smith, and Fletcher Loyal are on, because then Lance Jones doesn't have to do too much offensively. He could focus on what, like, be efficient offensively and guard, right? Guard, be mm -hmm. tough, all that. Fletcher Loyal, like, you, you have no idea what you're getting out of him. None. All year, right? All year. So, like, if he shows up again, I think the fact that he did it against Tennessee is going to mean something tomorrow. Yeah, and I, I do think that there is something to be said for the fact that this, these two teams have played before, right? Like Purdue is not going to – one of the things that I think Tennessee can do is surprise you a little bit with just how physical they are, right? Like you can watch it on tape. You can try to prepare for it in practice. Um, you can – if you're the if you're the coach, you can kind of say like, "Look, these guys are big, they're strong, they're old." Uh, Josiah Jordan James is basically built like a defensive end. You know, they, they're gonna they're gonna get up in you, they're gonna push you, they're gonna chuck cutters, they're gonna throw elbows. They're, it's going to be a dogfight when you play Tennessee, and you can say all that, but then when you actually have to go out and experience it, it's a completely different story, right? 
And I think the fact that Purdue has seen this, has dealt with it, and was going to fully understand just what they're going to be dealing with because there were 87 fouls called the first two times that these two teams played. Like They will be ready for that moment, and that's something that I think will be a little bit of an advantage for Purdue here. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, I think, I think again, that's part of why I'm curious how its game is officiated, right? Like, if Zach can stay on the floor, like if I, I bet Tennessee will do something. I know this sounds crazy. Do something similar to what Illinois did today, which is like, look, if Zach's on the floor, it's really hard to beat him. So we have to go after Zach Eady as many trips as we can, try to get him in foul trouble, try to limit his minutes. Because, look, I think one of the things that makes Zach Eady so special is that he has the physical conditioning to play 29, 30, 31 minutes a game. So, right? I mean, when you're dealing with those guys, like he is so impactful, but he's a lot less impactful. He's playing 24 minutes, right? Those extra seven, eight minutes that they steal with him on the floor are massive. So, look, I, I think that's a, that's a huge part of this game. I think the, the nerves and how both teams handle the moment is huge too, just because – everyone on the floor is aware of each other's marked struggles, right? And I think Purdue has played pretty loose throughout this tournament. Tennessee has been through that terrible game. That Texas game, I was down there in Charlotte. Like, it was ugly. They couldn't make anything, and you could see it on their faces. Like, not again. Not this again. Three for 25. We're going to lose this game. We're going to get bounced early. And I think, I think getting through that, and dealing with that and and finding a way to win that game was very freeing for this Tennessee group. And I thought they played really well, really confident, really loose against Creighton um, without a huge piece in Vescovy, who was obviously done with the flu. So um, I, I do think both teams will be loose, but what happens if one starts slow and they start to feel all the weight of this is the team? Because I think for both programs, there is a feeling of like, if not now, when? Yeah. I, I don't – I think it's just going to be a back and forth game. Like, I don't think anybody's going to run away with this one. I think it's going to be kind of a, a, a grinder type game. And again, there's so much it's pressure. It's three and a half, right? Is that what it is? Yes, I think so. There's yep. just so much pressure to when me I put my bed on Dalton three Connect. And a half. <laughs> if Dalton Connect does not play well, I don't think Tennessee can win this game. Like, and by well, I mean like 25 and an efficient 25. He can't be five for 18. He can't have one of those games. I don't think they could score enough points to win a game like this against Purdue. I the, don't. The only thing I would say is that I think having Ziegler is kind of the a little bit of an X factor there because he is like if you if you need a guy that can make life hell for Braden Smith that Braden Smith is going to struggle with. What I mean, what did we see last year in the tournament with Fairleigh Dickinson? I'm, I'm sorry, Purdue fans. I know you don't want to hear it, but we saw different Braden Smith. Yeah. No, I agree, but it was little guards that climbed up in him and made it difficult for him to be able to run offense. And um, I'm not saying that it, that is going to happen, but I'm saying if it is like if it does happen, it's going to be because you have a guy like Zakai Ziegler causing problems like that. If you want to take someone out of being able to run offense, it's you have a little guard that keeps you from being able to get within 35 feet of the rim when you're trying to run offense. Um, uh, yeah, so look, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about Duke-NC State when we get back from break, but I just want your official prediction here. What happens tomorrow? Who wins? Who's getting to the Final Four? Is it Matt Painter? Is it Rick Barnes? What is it? I think it's Purdue. I think it's Matt Painter. I think this group has been through so much and, and answered every call this year. Um, they have been so clutch when they've needed to be, and I think this Purdue team's different. I think they find a way to get to the Final Four, and obviously what a story it'd be. Yeah, I do too. I do too. I think, you know, as much as I've come around on Tennessee, I just think this Purdue team is, they're tough. They're mentally tough, you know, and I think Painter has handled it the right way with them. Kind of like Tony Bennett did, mm -hmm. right? Putting it out there in front of them. We're not hiding from this week. And I'm sure Painter talked to Tony Bennett at length about this and how to handle it. And it worked for Virginia. So why can't it work for Purdue? Yep. I, uh, I tend to agree. Um, I tend to think that this is something of a year of destiny for Purdue. And I'll be frank, I, I, I love this Tennessee team. I love Dalton Connect. But I really want to see Purdue get this thing done. I, I just I think that it is um, something where it's very – it's hard for me to root against 
good things happening for Zach Eady. You know what I mean? And like that, I, it's not because I don't like and Texas Painter and, and Painter. Painter. Like it's just think it, of all the shit he's taken. And it'd be great if Rick Barnes can be able to get there too. Like yep. I want that for him as well. And I would love to see Dalton Connect be able to celebrate and see him stage in the Final Four. That's what you want. The best players in the biggest moments, right? Most people want yeah. Purdue. I think I think most people that cover this sport, I think want. And you, you know what's funny about that? I guarantee that that is something that is getting said over and over and over and over again to Tennessee in that locker room. They don't want us. They don't Probably. want us there. They, they, they everybody I mean, hates us. And look, doesn't Rick Dan Early say that about everybody? His ability. It's working. Everybody his, hates him. His, everybody. They, he probably has him believing they're an underdog. Against Alabama, yeah, that's a, he's so, going to find one, a way. One Illinois guy tweeted right, this, right, that, right, exactly. that they weren't good enough. Yes. Yeah. The best thing that he ever did was we had an interview with uh, with our um, Creighton podcast from 2021. Oh, Jahan's Mena got had Ryan Kalkbrenner on, and Ryan Kalkbrenner um, said something about Adama Sonogo. Right? It was like it, it was pretty non descript d- descript yeah. and, and not really like dramatic or anything like that but he kind of said like i think i'm the best big guy in the big east uconn <laughs> staff found that right took that clip played it for adama and that was part of why i don't think it, it was so motivated the first it was yeah. just kind of like how do they do this man like they gotta find something better to do with their time early nato's they're master motivators they find all that in the media Put it together, mm-hmm. play it for their guys, so their guys just come out absolutely pissed off. <laughs> I love it; it's the best. Listen, we're gonna get to break when we come back. Duke, NC State, Tobacco Road rivalry. Who's gonna win? Kevin Sweeney's gonna tell you. That's coming up next. By now, you guys have surely heard about Autograph, an app founded by Tom Brady with the intention of disrupting the way that fans consume content covering their favorite teams. This is how the app works. All of the podcasters, bloggers, and digital creators covering a team have their content sent to that team's page in the Autograph app. Instead of having to bounce from site to site or trying to navigate the safer workspaces on Twitter, you can just scroll through Autograph. This isn't a hard sell. This is the truth. I am a UConn fan and I use the Autograph app to keep up with the writers I read and the pods that I listen to about UConn basketball. The best part is that every piece of content that you consume gives you reward points. The more you get, the more chances you have at things like discounted tickets to games and the grand prize, a trip to the LA regional and a spot in a suite for the Sweet 16 and Elite Eight games. Here's the best part. We've partnered with Autograph to donate $1 to the V Foundation every time someone downloads the app using the code F68 with a minimum of $2,500 getting donated. The app is free. So download, use the code F68, help us raise a little bit of money for cancer research and give Autograph a try. I promise you it will be worth it. And while we're here, a quick reminder, make sure that you subscribe to The Daily. We have new landing pages with deep dives into each coaching change, as well as a tracker that provides scouting reports on the transfers that have entered the portal that you are going to want to know about. Hit the link below to subscribe. Welcome back to the Saturday evening edition of the Field of 68 After Dark Live TD Garden Arena in Boston. Jeff Goodman, Kevin Sweeney, Rob Doster, we are live Sirius XM Channel 84. Gentlemen, I want to talk about Duke NC State real quick here. we got about 10 minutes left in the show. Um, Tobacco Road rivalry. We've seen Duke lose to NC State. I believe it was now 15 days ago. I think it was the third loss in this eight-game miracle run by Kevin Keats. Sweeney, what does Duke have to do to be able to get a little bit of revenge and get back to the Final Four, John Shire's first Final Four in his second season at the helm? Yeah, it looked like I think the best thing that could have happened to Duke was losing that game, looking back, right? Especially now that they play him again, right? Like, it is a scary game if they hadn't played each other in a while and it's a rival and they're play, you know they're free and Cinderella and you're, you have to win this game. The fact that they got beat by these guys 15 days ago, they are going to be jazzed up to play this game and i think they're going to come out firing i think look it's all about duke's guards we talked about their guards all year long i think they've been terrific in the tournament like i know it was it wasn't a ton of scoring yesterday or whatever it was think. against houston but tyrese proctor made some huge plays in that game like it was as Jimmy it was Roach a solid made, made had the dagger yes right? Roach hit the huge shot right i mean look when they played nc state in, in the acc tournament tyrese proctor 10 points four for 16 from the field 
It's Jared McCain, eight points, two for six. Jeremy Roach, five points, one for six. Mm-hmm. Part of that's NC State's defense. They have good, you know, good dudes on the perimeter who are, who are aggressive. But when Duke's guards play well, they're going to cause a lot of problems because Filipowski is going to win, you know, be able to win on the inside there. He's going to be able to get stuff done against DR and, and Burns. Like, I, I think Duke finds a way to win this game as long as it's guards deliver. And their guards have played great this March. I have no, no reason to believe that they won't play well uh, in, in this setting here tomorrow. And they can afford to have one of them have an off game. I mean, that's the beauty of their, their honestly, of their backcourt. They got three good guards. They're all capable of going for 15, 18 points. We've seen it all year. Roach is the veteran that you kind of trust, right? He made the big shot to put him up six the other night. Uh, Proctor has been inconsistent, but you know what? He's pretty good defensively. Like, that's the one thing you can count on with him. And, again, McCain can light it up. So, like, I, I, I just trust them. You know, they weren't great the other night. And, and as I said, they were lucky a little bit. They were lucky. Duke was? Yeah. I, I mean, listen, if Jamal Shedd doesn't go down, I don't think we're talking about Duke. I think we're talking about Houston. Don't you? Probably. Yeah. But, you I mean, know, the, but you need some luck. Yeah, like yeah. I said, I'm not taking anything away from well, I probably am taking a little bit away from him. You're taking more than just You're a taking the biggest win of the tournament. You're taking, You're taking every John Shire's biggest win of his career yeah, away yeah, from him. Yeah, I'm just saying sometimes you need some luck. He got it. Good for them. Now they got to win this one. Now you, you lose this one. This is a disastrous loss. This game will follow oh. John Shire if oh. he doesn't win it. You can't it lose this one. It will 100% follow him. Sure, because if you don't. You don't get that many of these opportunities. Mm-hmm. And when you get them in the Elite Eight and you play NC State. It's your rival. An 11 too. seed. An 11 seed. You know what's crazy about this right. NC State run? I, I was thinking about this the other day. I think it was the second round of the ACC tournament when they played Virginia Tech. Do you remember what happened at the end of that game? Virginia Tech was up by three and decided not to foul when they were up by three. If Virginia Tech fouls yeah. up by three and it's wins over. that game, it's over. It's over. Like right. NC State They're not isn't here. here. Yeah. Kevin Keats loses three years of guaranteed money. He probably loses his job. Yeah. Forget and three might, years. Might he's lose, probably out looking for job. another job right and now. And now and he's sitting here. Right. All he has to do is beat right. a team that he beat two weeks they were ago. Tied, the four. They were tied with four and a half minutes to go with yeah. Louisville. Right. right. Yeah, right. Louisville. Right. Kenny Payne nearly knocked him out. <laughs> All right. Give me, here we are. Give me predictions. Who wins? Look, I think Duke wins. I think the shooting luck. Uh, defensively that NC State's had. I mean, look, they've played great. They've earned Please. it, but they have also been very fortunate with how teams have shot against them. Please stop, particularly Please stop texting Jim Root. Please it's stop Duke. texting Jim Root. This shooting luck defense. Please stop texting Marquette Jim shot Root. four for 31. They were so open, you might have made them. Please stop so texting open. Jim Root. I think Doster would have made more than four out of 31. Doster would make open shots. Yeah, yeah. It, wasn't, it, wasn't, it. it wasn't shooting luck. It was, uh, let's just say that Marquette um, might have choked a little bit. I think that's what it was. <laughs> they got... Choked is the wrong word. I, I'm sorry. Choked is the wrong word. Nerves got the best of them. Yeah, I mean, listen, Duke's got to win this, right? I mean, they have to win this. They have so much more talent upside. I mean, I don't know. Like, I, I just can't see it. But, again, DJ Horn's been terrific, mm-hmm. making big shots. Uh, obviously, Burns is a beast in there, right? Like, tough to tough to match up. Like, I don't know. It, it, I hope it's a fun game. Like I hope this game goes down to the wire and it's a it's a fun game because we need we need those. I don't I don't think it's going to be a fun game. I think that um, I think that Duke is going to kind of pull away and win by double digits. The fun game is going to be the first one. The fun game is going to be the two twenty game tomorrow. Um, Purdue and Tennessee. We can't get two. We can't um, get two fun games. I would love to see two fun games, but I just don't. Don't be greedy. I don't be greedy. All we right. Here, I want to ask you this before before we get to our toast of the night. I just want to ask you guys this. All right. UConn has been up by 30 points in every single one of their games in this year's NCAA tournament. This is the 10th game in a row in the tournament where they have won by double digits. They have not in last year's national title run and so far in this year's run to the Final Four truly been tested by anybody. Where does this rank, Goodman, in terms of like the the greatest runs in, in tournament history, in college basketball history? Like what they are doing – is so unprecedented that it's just kind of – I don't even know how to put this into context. Well, I mean, again, we're in a different era. We're in a different era than mm-hmm. UCLA's teams back in – We're in a know. different era than the 2006-2007 Florida Totally, team. of course they we are. All of, they brought everybody back. They ran it back. 
Yeah, I mean, that was so much fun. Their team was so much fun to cover. I will mm-hmm. say that. Like, they just – the way they played together – and, and again, their personalities. How Keep, different we got three they minutes left. Keep on track. Yeah, they no, but I mean, listen, this this is impressive. The way they've been able to blow out every team. Um, we'll see what they can do. Because again, if if you win it all, if you if you repeat and you win this way in the final four, then you're going to put it up there as one of the greatest two year runs we've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I think look like. What are the pain points? What are like the nervous moments if you're a UConn fan over this last ten game and Silver Tournament? Yeah, this idiot, Iona, has been, right. Iona for a little bit. Five yeah. point game against San Diego State with five minutes to go, and that then that's a nervous. Mean, right? Yeah. But you're you're a little nervous though, right? And then today, twenty three, twenty three. Right? right, that's the closest they've been. There has been no sweat. Yeah. There has been look. We we just said you need a b- little bit of luck. Where has the luck been? There has been no UConn, like, oh, this was the game that they kind of got the break. Here's how they broke through. Here's what they needed. Like, they have went against big-time teams. Look, maybe they got a slightly easier draw last year, but, like, they have went against big-time teams. They have blown away all of them. And, uh, look, they, they they belong in the conversation of, you know, certainly best runs of all time, especially if they can cut down the nets again next week in Phoenix. Yeah, they have Alabama coming up next. We're going to spend plenty of time next week talking about that. Toasts of the night. Jeffrey, we'll go to you first in this one. Who are you toasting? Kling Kong. I'm going to say it right this time. Kling Kong, baby. Do I have to, like, as I say Kling Kong? Please do yes. I might have to. Maybe I'll rip open my shirt. <laughs> Definitely um, don't do that. Don't, yeah, we don't need that. Although I think I look better than Brad Underwood. <laughs> I think I do. I think I'm, I'm... – Anyway, Donovan Klingon, uh, he was so good tonight. So good tonight. Seriously. Like – Mm-hmm. He was ridiculous. So you, you got to toast to to Donna McClingan. Uh Toast to to Nato. It's a, a Final Four. Uh, completing what a ridiculous build this year. I mean, five years. The success that he's had, just unbelievable. And to do it with this group is, is as good a rebuild, reload, whatever you want to call it, as, as we've seen in college basketball in recent. There's only one other answer. I hope you choose it for toast of the night. Yeah. I don't know where you were going to go. My toast brown out. Lifetime contract. Uh, no, no. My my toast of the night was going to be Steph Castle as a guy that over Mark Sears. Yeah, as a guy. Well, he picked the Alabama guy. Mark Sears was awesome and had Dan, a great. Did not pick a UConn guy. Great guy in the second. Did not pick a yeah. UConn guy. And uh, if you wanted Mark Sears, you could have picked Mark Sears. Shit. I picked uh, Steph Castle. I'm going I Steph Castle. The the come. best player in the NCAA tournament to date was Terrence Shannon. Steph Castle had him tonight. Terrence Shannon was two for 12 from the floor, scored eight points. And this has been the Field of 68 after dark from TD Guard Arena. We're going to be back tomorrow night. Me, Jeff Randolph Childress from home. Finally. See you guys tomorrow.